Okay, so I guess it's time to start. So we welcome again Min Hyun Kim, who's going to talk about arithmetic geometry, quantum field theory, and the common structure problems for these two <laughs> subjects. Yes, I apologize for the pretentious title. I suspect that I'm one of the few people who took Young his suggestion seriously and really thought that this was a dialogue where I tried to be make an attempt to be entertaining rather than serious. Yeah. Having watched a bit of Lucas's previous talk where he was talking about serious mathematics, I'm quite worried now that I'll be left off the screen at least. But anyway, so I'll have a go. Uh, I have mostly prepared this with uh, having in mind the dialogue with physicists, but even they may find this laughably uh, easy and vague. So here we go. Um, so let me start with a completely ridiculous preliminary remark on infinity coming from history, right? So this is a picture of uh, the theorem of Archimedes on the sphere and the cylinder. Right? You have this sphere that fits completely inside the cylinder in the obvious way. And Archimedes theorem is that the volume of the cylinder is exactly three halves the volume of the sphere. So, um, this you can derive the, the volume formula for spheres from this, for example. Uh, the proof that he gave of this, which appears in the Archimedes palimpsest, which was rediscovered in the late 19th century at uh, they having disappeared for millennia, he gave a mechanical proof using physics. That is, he slices various things up into uh, disks and uh, balances them across a fulcrum and deduces that this object on the left, left side of the second picture, whose volume is three, four thirds the volume of the cylinder plus the volume of the sphere, it, uh, twice of that weight is four times the volume of the cylinder. So he gives a mechanical argument of this. Uh, then hey, later on, he gives what's regarded as a rigorous proof, but he makes clear that this is the proof that he had in mind first. Of course, it took a long time to make this proof rigorous because people had to get used to the idea of adding up infinite, infinitely many slices that are infinitesimally fixed with required integration. Now we can prove it this way. It took, it took um, about 1,600 1, years, I guess, for this proof to come to be made regret. So this is just a lesson for mathematicians and physicists struggling with infinity these days. I also quoted briefly uh, Plutarch's assessment of Archimedes and his work. Essentially, what he's trying to say, you don't have to read it. He says that Archimedes made all these mechanical inventions that you read about in legend, and he did all, all this physics, but he said, it's, but Plutarch claims Archimedes didn't care about it. He just cared about pure, pure mathematics, essentially, theoretical pursuit. Now, this is a load of nonsense, by the way. If you read Archimedes himself, he has nothing, there's nothing in it that indicates that he wasn't interested in applications. He moved quite freely between physics, engineering, and mathematics, and there's no indication that he thought lowly of any of them. But Plutarch and people like that, Cicero, made up this legend of the pure-hearted Archimedes that sometimes still affects mathematicians adversely these days. So we should get over this idea of pure mathematics. I just put that up as a moral related to the previous proof. Okay, now we're supposed to talk about arithmetic geometry and quantum field theory. So let me briefly go over some common structures that we in line with my pretentious title that occur in both topics, both subjects. So for example, in both in both arithmetic geometry and quantum field theory, we are interested in rings, right? And so in, in, in physics, they might be rings of local operators. And then uh, we are both interested in sheaves, which appear in physics often as fields. Now, it's also interesting that we're not just interested in sheaves. We're also interested in sections of sheaves, which are also fields, right? So this is uh, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between the two if you're, out, if you're not an expert. And for a ma poor mathematicians, it takes a while to uh, fig figure out which field the physicist is talking about, right? So a principal bundle with connection, for example, is a field, right? The sections of it are also fields. So this is a kind of source of confusion, uh, which can sometimes be serious. Anyways, you have both kinds of fields and uh, both kinds of objects, sheaves and sections of sheaves that you're interested in in arithmetic geometry. And then we're interested in infinities. So it's funny to refer to it as structures, 
but maybe they are structured and it might not be helpful to think of infinities as structures in some way. But anyways, they occur in both subjects and are the source of deep problems that touch on important issues. All right. Now, uh, I don't know, if, can you see the title of this slide? I think, is this okay? Can everybody see it? it's a bit? Yes, this is okay, yes. Is this okay, yeah, and you can see my cursor as well? It's fine, that's all fine, yes. Okay, thanks, okay. So, <clears throat> so let me now make, make a few personal remarks on what arithmetic geometry and quantum field theory should learn from each other. So what should quantum field theories learn from arithmetic geometry. So this sounds almost like a joke, but I mean it seriously. You guys should learn about finitely generated rings. Not just rings like R and C, right? And sometimes, okay, things like finite fields, Philip Candelas and you know, Daniel de la Osa and so forth are, are interested in that. But those are not quite as serious as these rings that are finally generated over Z of characteristic zero like this, right? So I wrote down a random looking example, right? So this is the subject of arithmetic geometry rings of this sort, right? And objects that you get by gluing these things together, these are called schemes of finite type. Yeah? And the, the arithmetic geometry is largely concerned with stream doing geometry directly over these rings. And this is a very powerful point of view, which I think should be useful for physicists as well, maybe even fundamental if I'm pretentious enough. Right. Because uh, there's something about being able to do directly geometry with these rings that provides a deeper insight into the structure of even complex geometric objects than um, would be available otherwise. So that's what uh, physicists should learn about arithmetic geometry, uh, from arithmetic geometry, geometry over rings like this. Now, what should arithmetic geometers learn about quantum field theory? So it took me a while to really formulate this. And many hours and days and years of talking to physicists. Right? Essentially, we should learn from physicists about categories. Now, somebody will object. Well, of course, well, arithmetic geometers know about categories. Uh, what, what are you talking about? Well, that's true, but what I mean is that we should learn about categories as generalizations of rings. What do I mean? Well, you see, normal rings, which is where classical arithmetic geometry takes place, really has to do with operators that are inserted at points, local, really point local operators. This is where rings arise from the point of view of physics. But physicists in the meanwhile have moved considerably beyond operators of this sort. Right? So for example, you, might, you can have operators inserted, inserted along lines, line operators, and these form categories rather than rings. They are ring-like categories with suitable kinds of structure that I'm not going to go into because they can get quite elaborate. But operators inserted along lines are no longer rings. They are categories with ring-like structures. And then you keep going. If you insert operators, operators that can be inserted along surfaces become two categories and so on. And this keeps going up as you insert it along higher and higher dimensions along these extended, so-called extended operators. So physicists are somehow revolutionizing the algebraic structures of the objects that arise from natural problems in physics and generalizing rings thereby. And we really need to come to grips with these kinds of structures within mathematics as a whole and in its really of geometry in particular. So that's one thing uh, among many things that arithmetic geometry should learn from the physicists. And then thirdly, uh, both should learn from each other about infinities. We both both classes of people struggle with infinities right, in different ways and put in efforts to tame the infinity. Right? But the different techniques are quite interesting. The differences between the point, the techniques are interesting and there's a lot to learn from what the others are doing. Right. Now, so since I said that physicists should learn about finally generated rings, I'm going to teach you a little bit about it. So <clears throat> this is a crash course on schemes of finite time. Mm. So this, as I said, this is going to be very elementary. So uh, uh, most mathematicians will be irritated about it and maybe even some physicists. Um, so what mostly I'm going to talk about the spectrum that is the geometry that's intrinsic to finally generated rings. So what is this? 
So I'm going to give a physicist's definition of the spectrum. So if you're given a commutative ring with unity, the spectrum of A is simply the equivalence class of pure states of A. What is a pure state? Well, that's just a ring homomorphism to a field. So people who are familiar with operator algebras, right, will be uh, used to this idea of a pure state. It's a ring homomorphism, except notice I'm not working with an algebra over the complex numbers or something. I'm just working with an abstract ring. So I just take a homomorphism to any field and recall that a state. Now, there's a certain equivalence relation here. What's the equivalence relation? There's a trivial change of target is the equivalence relation. That is to say, if you take have a homomorphism to K1 and another homomorphism to K2, we'll say they're equivalent if, if one is obtained from the other by changing just the target by some ring homomorphism, field, field inclusion in the target. So trivial change of, of, of values is what the equivalence relation is. And now, to return to the definition, the spectrum of a ring is just the equivalence classes of pure states in this sense. Okay. So these, of course, this k could be regarded as values of the operator with respect to the state, right? And the difference in finitely generated rings versus a situation you're, you're working over the complex numbers or something is that the field of values can change with the state. That's the main charm of arithmetic geometry. Okay. I'll also refer to the point spectrum. Right? The point spectrum are, is just a subset of, this, of the spectrum consisting of the states that are surjective, that where this uh, k, it surjects from a to k. Now, it turns out that there's a certain order in, in, the, in the set of states, right? So that uh, these are really are the ones that are the smallest. And I'll explain a bit more about that later. But anyway, it's the surjective homomorphism. Refer, I call the point spectrum and I've denoted with this subscript zero. So for example, if you take the spectrum of Z, the point spectrum are just the homomorphisms to the finite field Z mod P, right? So what about the whole spectrum? It also includes the homomorphism from Z to Q. So that's the whole spectrum, the point spectrum, and then this extra point that goes to this larger field. And then the point spectrum of the polynomial ring over C, right, is just C itself, even by evaluating polynomials at various points in C. While uh, the, the whole spectrum also includes the, uh, uh, the point, the, 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 the states that includes the polynomial ring into its field of fraction. And one goes on, and there's a lot of examples like this. So if you look at the point spectrum of the polynomial ring in N variables, that C to the N, corresponding to evaluating each of the Xi's on a complex number. Whereas uh, uh, if you take the whole spectrum, it, it includes elements like what we had before, uh, uh, states that include the polynomial ring into its field of fractions or fields of rational function. But actually there are also points, which I'm not going to describe, one for each algebraic subset of Cn, whose value is the field of rational functions on such a field algebraic subset. So there are these kind of extended points in the theory of schemes as well, in the theory of spectra in arithmetic geometry. Uh, if you take a quotient of a polynomial ring like this by some set of equations, then uh, of course, any homomorphism from this quotient ring to K will give rise to homomorphism from the polynomial ring itself before taking quotient just by composing with the projection. So you can see that the spectrum of this quotient ring is a subset of the, spec of the spectrum of the polynomial ring. And if you work it out, so for example, if you take the point spectrum, this turns out just turns out to be the elements in CN that, uh, that are killed by this defining equation. And you can give a similar description of the whole spectrum. Right. Now, also, this is a quick introduction to the flavor of spectrum. Obviously, a ring homomorphism from A to B right, induces a map of spectra going in the other direction because, uh, you know, if you, stay, if you stay have a state on B, then you can compose it with this ring homomorphism to get a state on A. So that's this arrow going in the other direction. So for example, so here's a, an example of a number theoretic flavor. If you include Z in the Gaussian integers, 
the, the structure of this map from spec B to spec A is quite interesting. So just to give you a sense of the kind of thing that happens, which is the subject of algebraic number theory. So here's the kind of thing that happens with primes in Z that happens inside the Gaussian if theory. They often decompose. So for example, two can be written as the product of one minus I and one plus I. Five can be written as the product of two minus I and two plus I and so on. So this, there's these decompositions that occur while three, seven, 11, 19, these things remain prime inside the Gaussian integers. So what happens as a consequence from the point of view of the spectrum, I'll draw a picture here. So take, take for example, the, the state that reduces mod five, sends Z to Z, the finite field Z mod five. You can include Z into the Gaussian integer and reduce mod two minus I. So this turns out to be a finite field that's actually isomorphic to Z mod I. There's, a, there, there's an inclusion from Z mod five to Z mod, Z I mod two I, which is just an isomorphism. <coughs> so this up, upper arrow is a state that restricts to the state on Z that reduces mod five. But you see the one with two plus I does the same thing. So what you can happen, have, hap, what happens is then that on Z mod I, there are several states, two states that restrict to the same state on Z. So this kind of phenomenon is the subject of algebraic number theory and trying to see what happens here uh, with more complicated rhythmic extensions and so on. Okay, so there's a quick introduction to the spectrum. Now, let me mention what in some sense is the key problem, one of the key problems of arithmetic geometry. Actually, sorry, maybe I should pause for a second because I'm going reasonably quickly, I guess. Are there any questions? No? It's all very clear. Okay, okay so let's move on. So this is the subject of zeta functions. <clears throat> now, what happens is that if you take an A that's finally generated, right, in the sense that I, I mentioned at the beginning, you have Z and then you add, say, finally many elements and then look at the ring generated by such a thing. If you take a finally generated ring and you take a point spectrum, an element of the point spectrum where you subject onto a field, then it's a fact that in that case, the field of values is necessarily a finite field. To have a surjection like this, K has to be a finite field. So that's the nature of the point spectrum in this case. So in particular, you define the norm of the state to be simply the number of elements inside that finite field. There's the number of possible values of the state. So since it's finite, we can just count them and define that to be the norm of the state. Now what the zeta function of the ring A is then defined by this infinite product formula. Uh, you take one over one minus, oh, sorry, this should have been wrote to the minus s, sorry about that, norm to the minus s, right? and take the product over all points, all elements of the point spectrum. That's the zeta function of A. Okay. So uh, for example, let me give, give you a few examples. If you do it for Z, A equals Z, this is just a familiar Riemann zeta function. You take the product over primes, remember, uh, the, the point elements of the point spectrum were reduction mod p maps, and the values are these finite fields fp. So for each of those, you get a contribution of p raised to the minus s, then one over one minus that, and take the product over p. That just gives you the Riemann zeta function. <clears throat> if you did this to the polynomial ring in one variable over fp, you get a similar kind of expression, where except you're now taking the product of our all irreducible monic polynomials in FPX. This is similar to taking a product over primes. And what the thing you're taking a product of is one over one minus P to the minus degree of the polynomial times S. So that's similar to the expression, to the expression in the Riemann zeta function, except it's always the same P somehow, because you can't get varying P when you start out with the ground field FP. It's also possible to reorganize this. This is kind of an amusing exercise that you should try if you've never done it before. And this becomes just one over one minus P to the one minus S. And everything simplifies tremendously. <clears throat> if you take N variables and do the same thing, you get one over one minus P to the N minus S rather than one minus S. Yes, by a similar calculation in some sense. 
Now, if you took the zeta function of the polynomial ring in n variables over z, somehow you mix up all of these things, right? And you get a product over prime of the zeta over primes in z of the zeta function of this guy, the polynomial ring in n variables over fp. So in other words, you get uh, the zeta function of z, the usual Riemann zeta function shifted by n. That's what you get when you take a product like this, because you get the same shift by n occurring for every prime. So these are all, these are actually all pleasant calculations of zeta function. Suppose you did the computed the zeta function of a funny ring like this. This is the polynomials in two variables over the finite field with three elements, modulo on equation defining an elliptic curve. That's actually what this is. If you computed this, so here's the formula you get. You get this nice rational function in three to the minus s. And these kind of formulas are typical when you compute zeta functions of these kind of cubic equation quotients of polynomial rings in three var two variables over a finite field. In general, if you did this over some fp where p is not equal to 11, then you get a similar expression, except this coefficients of p to the minus s is some number that varies in an interesting way with p. It's an integer that has to do with the number of solutions to this equation over fp. Now, if you computed the zeta function of the same kind of ring except over z rather than fp, so what you'll get is the product of all of these kind of things. The contribution of 11 just looks like this. But another interesting fact is that, so this looks like a horrible infinite product, it is. But it's a fact that in fact, you can just write it as a quotient of the Riemann zeta function divided by another function. This is called the L function of a modular form. F is a modular form. What it looks like is like this. F is this mod in another infinite product. It's a modular form of weight two, right? And the L function is just defined by an integral like this. So it has nice analytic properties. So this kind of theorem you know, identity of course, is the subject of uh, the theorem of Andrew Wise in greater, much greater generality. So now uh, let me mention the key difficult problem. This is called the Hasse-Ve conjecture. What it says is that if you take any finitely generated ring, right, and compute the zeta function, right, then this is actually a meromorphic function on C, which at most finitely many poles, and these poles occur at integer values of S. Right, so I, I didn't say it at the beginning, but this is not going to converge for all S. It converges for real part of S sufficiently large. One can prove that. That also takes some doing, but you can prove that. But then the Hasse-Ve conjecture says that it has a meromorphic continuation to all of C. So this is the main, one of the main infinity problems of number theory. Proving this conjecture is known only in very, very few, few cases, right? In, but and in fact, a main motivation of the Langlands program is to prove the Hasse-Ve conjecture by establishing a connection to automorphic forms, similar to that formula involving modular forms for elliptic curves that I showed you earlier. So if you look at Langlands earlier papers, he'll in fact say that this is the motivation for the Langlands program. It changed, it, it was modified and grew somehow in different directions afterwards. But even now, of course, it is a main motivation distance of this meromorphic continuation. So, so this formula generalizes to something called L functions. So now I'll up the language a little bit. Okay? So what you can do is you can start with a sheaf on spec of A and define its L function, L number actually, it's not a function the way I wrote it, by a formula like this. It's similar to what you had before, but you now go over the, take a product over point spectrum and look at determinant of one minus an operator called the Frobenius. Remember, this was a, this X is a finite field somehow, right? So there's a Frobenius map acting on the stock of V over X bar. Actually, this is slight abusive notation, but X evaluated under algebraic closure, yeah, V evaluated under algebraic closure of X. Right? So you get a, 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 this is a kind of L invariant of the shape, right? What is the L function from before? But uh, you can turn it into an L function by sticking in this norm to the minus S as before. So this way, the zeta function that we defined earlier is just the case where Vx B is the trivial shift, but you, you, it's generalized in this way. But the point of view that's kind of important, that's 
well known, but still not emphasized often enough, is you should really just think of the L invariant in this way. And the variable S just comes in to the sheaf, right? It's because you're pairing the sheaf inside the family that you get a complex variable occurring in these formulas. So it's this uh, function of sheaves that you're actually studying. So if you, the, the Hasse-Weil conjecture generalizes to this situation that when V is something called a motivic sheaf, something that comes from geometry, then this should also be analytic, actually meromorphic depending on the situation and often analytic in S. So this is the more general Hasse-Weil conjecture. Okay, so this is uh, one of the very, very important unsolved problems in number theory, right? And any progress on this for a non-trivial variety of dimension, dimension scheme of dimension three and above would be a big, big advance. But uh, let me emphasize again, there's this meromorphicity and so on. But in my view, the key problem is to just define the infinite product for general V. So you can start from a V and you can twist it by an S of very large real part. And then this converges and you turn it into a problem of an meromorphic continuation. But in a sense, the key problem is just to be able to define this product for natural Vs. Right? So it's an infinite product regularization problem of some sort. So uh, what I wanted to say today, as I said, you shouldn't take what, uh, what, uh, what come on the next slides at all seriously. Up till now was kind of pedagogical and commonplace, but still it's meant to be entertaining and I didn't say anything wrong, at least not seriously. But now it's going to be some serious speculation, but uh, serious in the sense that's badly serious speculation. So is there a counterfeit theoretic interpretation of this thing? This construction just out. So let me first point the following out. If you take these factors, one over determinant of fx acting on vA, this of course is just a trace of the same operator acting on the symmetric algebra right? of vA. So I'll write this as an expectation value since that's a trace. Also, if you think about this symmetric algebra, this is just an algebra, of course, you're in general, in, in actual quantum mechanics over C, you'd have to do completions and all that kind of nonsense. But it's the algebraic quantization of this symplectic vector space V cross V dual, right? Which also admits the action of this Frobenius as a symplectic transformation. So now, so, so suppose you computed the expectation value of all the product of all of these axes acting on the infinite product of the Hilbert spaces associated to each pure state. So this is the trace of product over X of FX acting on the tensor product of the Hilbert space. Now, formally, if this made sense, you know that trace of a tensor product is product of traces. So this is actually product over X of trace of Frobenius acting on the Hilbert space associated to X, which then is just a trace product over x of one over the determinant. So in other words, this is the L function. So the L function can formally be realized as the expectation value of this infinite product of Rubini. So this I find to be rather suggestive, even though it's hard to get anything out of it. In particular, this infinite product of Hilbert spaces if you think about it, this is formally the quantum Hilbert space associated to the space of sections of V cross V dual. Yeah. So this is, this is the distinction I was making earlier between um, the field, uh, the bundle itself as a field versus the sections as a field, right? So for example, you know, when you're just doing um, a free scalar field or something like that in the first course on quantum field theory, V would be R, right? And V cross V dual would be, at the space of phi, phi dot, right? And so you get the phase space. And then if you quantize the space of phi's, right? Which are the functions with values in V cross V dual, then you get exactly formally this infinite tensor product. Yeah? Uh, so, so as I said, the reason I find this interesting, even though it's a very simple remark in physics, People actually, I have succeeded from the beginning of a course on quantum field theory in making sense of this infinite tensor product. So for example, uh, as I said, all physicists know, uh, even if you try to compute the, the, the Hamiltonian on, uh, on of a free 
scalar field, right? On this infinite tensor product, immediately you encounter infinity if you do it naively, right? And then you use the process of normal ordering and the existence of a vacuum inside this Hilbert space, right? To regularize it, then you get a finite number. So I, 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 this is what I was saying earlier. So that the kind of techniques that physicists use to tame infinities of this sort. Uh, uh, so I, I speculate about ways to make it relevant in the problem of defining these L functions as infinite product for general V. Okay. So um, you may also know, uh, some of you may have, might have heard about this, when A is uh, the ring of integers itself, just Z, then spec of Z actually has the cohomological properties of a three manifold. Some people have made a big deal of this, sometimes called the arithmetic topology, where spectrum of Z or spectrum of ring of integers inside number of algebraic number of is behave like a three manifold in many ways, right? And uh, um, so uh, this is actually a rather interesting subject. Uh, I find it quite interesting reasonably anyways, uh, recently anyways, uh, 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 studying a kind of gauge theory associated with this interpretation. But I should also remark that in fact, the general Hasevey conjecture reduces to this case. Yeah. Yeah, so if you consider, the Hasevey conjecture for L functions over spec Z, most of L functions over spec Z, the general Hasevey conjecture just follows from it. Everything can be reduced to this case. And the spectrum of Z has the cohomological properties of a three manifold. So if you see uh, this Hilbert space, yeah, infinite tensor product over the points of spec Z over Hilbert space occurring like this, right? And if this is the quantum Hilbert space of a theory, right, then this does suggest the presence of a kind of four-dimensional theory for which spec Z is a 3D space like slice. So a number of people have been speculating about this in relation to the Langdon program, Benz, Lee, and Kotesh, Gates, Corey in the analog over a finite field, right? And this interpretation of the L function via this infinite tensor product, right? Seems to me another bit of evidence that there's a kind of arithmetic four-dimensional theory that uh, one might try to define possibly in some categorical fashion. Uh, and hopefully it has something to say about this problem of defining L functions. Okay, maybe I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Inhyung. Hmm? I start time for questions now. Can I, could I ask the question? Yes, please. Thank you, Mignon, for that wonderful overview. This was really nice. This is kind of the dialogue that I was, I was hoping for because it's- no, I'm trying to please you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic because you also give plenty of time to, to chat. So let me just try to understand. I guess I'm trying to understand this for years with conversations hmm? with you. So is, is your basic premise that correlation functions should be realized as zeta functions of certain type? Well, the other way around, that uh, zeta functions be, should be realized as correlation functions. <laughs> so you correlation functions of which field theory? So is it possible, is that the basic, you know, which direction are you trying to go? Well, for example, here, if I did this formally, as I said, it would be called just a field theory where the fields are sections of your sheaf cross its dual. Uh, actually, the, the phase space of the fields are the sections. Of course, the fields themselves will be just sections of V. I see. Mm -hmm. So if I took so something can... really, if I took something basic like the Riemann zeta function for, for so and I reconstructed the correlation function, what quantum field theory would these correlation functions be? Uh, so, th so that would be just, yeah. So that would be the case where uh, this, this V is trivial, right? So. Uh, v itself is trivial, so this would be the quantum field theory of just functions on spec Z. Quantum field theory of, sorry. Functions on, where the fields are functions on spec Z. It has to be a quantum field theory where on, on Z, right? Right, but uh, actually the, where spec Z is the space, so the time dimension that, that's not appearing in this story. <laughs> so it will be a quantum field theory where the, the initial conditions are uh, a pair of functions on spec Z. So it's a zero dimensional quantum field theory. <laughs> no, no, why zero? No, no, scalar field theory on, on, a, on a four dimensional arithmetic manifold. 
Yeah. No, not the ordination I don't. Yeah. Okay. okay. I see. I see. Yeah. So, but, yeah, but whatever quantum field theory you get, you will, it, it's always a, a quantum field theory on some geometrical object thought of as a spec of something. It's a quantum field theory, as I said, of fields and things like spec Z. I see. Or does, spec it go, Z. Like, does it go the other way? Like if I take like, you know, quantum field theory as a physicist, like, I don't know, five to the fourth, can I construct a zeta function out of it? Uh, well, uh, so uh, if you were trying to do that, let's say, okay, so I, I think I do have a kind of answer to that question, right? But uh, the, the, it'll depend on uh, the answer to a question that I don't know that you probably don't, right? So let's say we were doing right to the fourth theory on say some compact manifold, say S3 cross R or something, right? Okay. Now, uh, there are line operators in this theory, are there? Yeah, okay, that's a question. Are there line interesting line operators in the theory? Um, I would, I guess so. Andre, help me. I guess so. Um, so this is the like, one, you know, one like you know, like Wilson loops in this theory. Or that's right. Yeah, Wilson. Are there things like Wilson loops? But possibly not. So maybe we should take a gauge theory. Well, you need a gauge exactly. You need some kind of a gauge structure. Uh huh. So very roughly speaking, although I, there are uh, some reason why I'm not entirely confident about it, right? But if you took the correlation function of a product of Wilson loop operators, right? That would be analogous to this zeta function. Uh, a, a finite product though. Well, infinite, unfortunately, infinite okay. product. So yeah. that's, yeah, so that's, that's why well, I, I, I don't I, I, like I, this. And that, that infinite product is something like the analog of the Euler product or something. That's right, yeah, that's right. I see. Actually, so do you know whether there's ever an infinite product of, say, uh, line operators occurring in quantum field theory? Good question. Thank you. Well, but you see, it's interesting because, of course, infinite products of line operators don't necessarily occur. But returning to my earlier naive comment, if, if even if you take something like that, the, the Hamiltonian, right, in a scalar field theory, you do have a contribution from every one of the modes, right? <laughs> even though it's not a, you don't think of the operator itself as an infinite product. In principle, the Hilbert space, the way it's usually presented, is an infinite product over momenta infinite tensor product over momenta and the Hamiltonian contributes, had, receives a contribution from every momentum that you need to make sense of. Mm. So problems of this infinite tensor product type do occur even at the very, very naive level of quantum field theory and physicists have solved it <laughs> in, right. in interesting cases. Right. I guess if you have a quantum field theory of infinite number of gauge connections, I don't think that's quite right. It's more like infinite number of operators rather than infinite you know, number of molecules. Yeah, I, I think you should just think. So, so if, if, perfect for that sort of thing. Uh, if I would press the analogy a bit, what is this V like? It's more like if you're fixing one connection, right? Yeah. And considering a Higgs, Higgs field. Yeah. It's more like quantizing a space of Higgs field with a fixed connection. Right. Because this is a single locally constant shift, and the symmetric product will arise. Tensor product of the symmetric products arise if you quantize the space of sections of this of this single shift. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's, it's a bunch no, of nonsense. Is, I've never thought about it. This uh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Is this related to higher gauge theory? So where you have you have higher forms instead of uh, from connection. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I, I'm open to all kinds of uh, um, um, possibilities, but uh, I don't know. Mm, uh, so, uh, I haven't thought about this hard enough. And, uh, uh, but this was uh, these were supposed to be dialogues, so I was hoping to get some help from physicists. <laughs> no, yes, that's a good question. So, how many physicists are actually here? Mm -hmm. I just want to check the audience of like, what's the breakup? I mean, it's usually been fairly mixed, right, Andre? You know, like, it's been fairly good. 
No. Yes. I don't know exactly who are physicists. So. One question that I had, so you mentioned the Langdon's program and uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned poles, finitely many poles, meromorphic functions, but uh, what is known about the zeros of these zeta functions? Are there any interesting statements like the Riemann hypothesis? The, there are analogs of the Riemann hypothesis. Have, the, the, the poles are supposed to come from algae. So I spoke about spec A, but A actually is something like the ring of functions on a variety over Z, right? So that's the way you interpret this. And the poles of the zeta function have to do with algebraic cycles. On the, uh, the, the pole, algebraic cycles on the variety contribute poles. Now, zeros, some zeros also have to do with uh, so let's see if I can say this correctly. Zeros uh, at certain values have to do with extensions of motifs in some sense. So these, these have to do with the, so let me restate, I'm saying this wrong. Poles have to do with uh, cycles modulo homological equivalence, right? And many of the zeros are accounted for by cycles that are homologically equivalent to zero. That's what gives you many of the integer, integer zeros. Now, if you have half integer zeros, yeah. like in the Riemann hypothesis, that doesn't normally occur in this theory. So I, that, that's not so much part of this theory in some sense. So that's a funny thing about the Riemann hypothesis. Everybody, people get worked up about the Riemann hypothesis, but it's not somehow part of standard arithmetic geometry in a certain sense. Well, it is, of course, because you have the Riemann hypothesis over finite fields, and these play a role in the convergence properties of these functions. But somehow it's hard to make it fit into this kind of general theory. By the way, I don't know if this is, this is, again, very unknown to experts, but not stated often enough. Langland's program has nothing to say normally about the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of reasons why one can make that statement. It's but partly it's because maybe the, the Langlands program is relevant to these questions. It says then motivic L function or automorphic L functions, right? And the zeta function of Z is the only L function that's simultaneously automorphic and motivic. <laughs> so Langlands program says nothing about that. And in, in general, Langlands program doesn't by itself say anything about zeros and poles and things like that. <laughs> So Z is very special in that sense. In some way, in way it's not that way. <laughs> and then that the origin of this one half is just, it's this one half is just for Z and not for the other generic L function. No, no, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's a, there, there, is a, there is a line of reflection. There are these functional equations that I've right. been omitting right. from right. The, right. the story. So uh, uh, these are L functions for a, so like a Zeta function of, of, of a scheme of finite tab will, Break down it, break up into L functions of it, how cohomology. So if you look at the contribution of degree degree i, right, mm -hmm. then it has a satisfies a functional equation across the line real part of S equals n plus one minus i, when, where n is the dimension. Uh -huh. So so uh, so then what will happen is that uh, um, the, the so yeah i goes to n plus one minus i. So uh, uh, n plus one over two is the line of reflection. So if n is even, you get an odd degree, uh, sorry, a non-integral half integer line of reflection. And you can try to generalize the Riemann hypothesis and say something about that. But standard motivic theory doesn't say anything about that somehow, that you have to go further. So the integral zeros have to do with motives cycles that are homological equivalent to zero. Well, thank you, Min Young. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. It's awesome, thank mm -hmm. you very much.